Hi there, I'm Savannah Mexto with Manor Law Group, and I'm excited to welcome you to another webinar Wednesday with esteemed elder law and estate planning attorney, Robert Manor. This week, attorney Bob Manor is discussing a planning technique that's been around for a while. In fact, it's been around so long, there could be a better option to accomplish your planning goals. But what are other options do you have? Let's stick around and you'll find out. But before I pass the mic to Bob, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping details. First, even though Bob is an attorney, today's webinar will not give specific legal advice. If you have a question about your unique situation, please contact us after the webinar. Also, if you have a general question during today's presentation, we encourage you to use the question box. We'll save time at the end of the presentation to review questions, and if for some reason we don't get to your question, we will contact you after the webinar. Lastly, today's presentation will be recorded and the replay will be sent out tomorrow so that you can share it with family, friends, or anyone who you think could benefit from hearing this information. Now, why should you listen to what the folks at Manor Law Group have to say? We're a nationally recognized and respected elder law and estate planning firm. All three of our attorneys are accredited by the Veterans Administration to assist veterans with claims and appeals. Attorney Bob Manor is nationally board certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation. He's one of only 19 attorneys in Michigan to achieve this designation. Bob is also a leader among elder law attorneys in Michigan. He is currently chair-elect of the State Bar of Michigan Elder Law and Disability Rights Section and past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, Michigan chapter. And of course, Manor Law Group has been honored by readers of our local paper as the best or favorite law firm for the last eight years in a row. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome attorney Bob Manor. Hi folks, this is a very good topic. And one of the reasons it's a very good topic is because, oops, I went a little too fast there, is because that it is such an overused uh, option for estate planning and for other purposes. And so, I've lectured about this to other attorneys, and I think uh, there's one sort of subset of attorneys that kind of are generally in agreement with me that the ladybird deeds are overused. And then there's a lot of attorneys that, uh, that tend to uh, recommend these. And I even heard uh, from uh, one of our favorite clients that they were offering a form at the Register of Deeds that would have a ladybird deed as the form that should never the ladybird deeds are more way more complicated than they seem and they should never be done in a fill in the blank form that's that the, the idea that somebody that a, that a county office is handing out a form uh of a ladybird deed is such a bad idea because it can cause all kinds of complications that aren't expected so let's start off with this um i was asked to talk about ladybird deeds at one of the local senior centers a few years ago and uh, I thought it was interesting because they gave me an hour to talk about it. Well, uh, you know, I could probably talk about anything for an hour if you want to be honest, but I thought, well, I need to come up with some, uh, some, some stories or some examples or some visuals. And so the visual I used for the Ladybird deed was uh, the Rubik's Cube. <laughs> now, if you remember the Rubik's Cube, if you were around in the 1980s, uh, every kid in, in the 1980s and a whole lot of adults uh, had to have a Rubik's Cube. It was very trendy. It was very, you know, that, that's that puzzle that you turn and there's, there's the six sides of it and you turn and you try to get all the sides matching. And so I used the example of uh, the analogy of a ladybird deed being like a Rubik's Cube. And the two primary reasons I called it a Rubik's Cube is because, number one, it was very trendy, uh, like the Rubik's Cube was in the 80s. And a lot of people were using it because it was cool, it was new, it was exciting, and it was trendy. And secondly, very few people actually knew how to solve the Rubik's Cube. I remember playing with it for hours, and I think there's some kind of trick that you can learn now to, to solve it. But I remember as a kid in the 80s, I was uh, I, I would play with it for hours, and I'd get one side solved, and sometimes get two sides solved, and the, you know, you could get multiple sides solved, but then it would mess up the other sides. And that's exactly the perfect example for the Ladybird deed, because when we're narrowly focused, so I used to have a Rubik's Cube uh, as a, as a 
prop and as an example, and I would hide all of five of the six sides, and I would just show the one side, and I'd say, look, I solved it, right? So if you're focused on one thing, like avoiding probate, so we say, okay, use the Lady Bird deed because it's going to avoid probate. Well, guess what? It might avoid probate, but not necessarily in the way that we want to. And it might not even avoid probate because it creates all these other issues. And it's like the Rubik's Cube where you solve one side, and as soon as you try to solve another side, you mess up the side that you solved. And so uh, I'm going to give you some concrete examples of why that is. Now, having said all of that, uh, the, the title of this presentation was uh, a little bit uh, overstated because ladybird deeds aren't always bad, right? Ladybird deeds are not always bad. They're just overused and they're frequently bad and they frequently cause more trouble than the person that signed it, than the owner of the house ever imagined or expected that it was going to, okay? And so I'm going to give you some examples of that uh, and why I don't recommend using those for estate planning purposes. I will also say that we do use them in very, very limited circumstances, and that's the problem. Typically, anything that's good for one purpose sometimes gets overused for other purposes. And so we definitely use Lady Bird deeds for some very specific purposes, but uh, it gets um, overstated. And so, uh, you know, I've talked to, I've done some education of other lawyers on this, and not everybody agrees with me on this. They they think that this is a, a, an easy solution, and I think it's a uh, an easy solution to create lots of more problems. <laughs> you know, you solve one side, but you don't solve the other problems, and often those other problems are much bigger than the issue. Frankly, in many cases, I would rather go through probate than have a bad ladybird deed. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody thinks, oh, well, you got to avoid probate. You got to avoid probate. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I would prefer to avoid probate if there's, uh, in, in almost all cases, not every case, but in most cases, I think that there's going to be a better, simpler, faster, cheaper way to uh, transfer property other than going through probate. And, uh, but this is often not the answer. So, Let's go through the history of this a little bit. Savannah kind of talked about this from uh, from saying it's been around for a while. It has been around for a while. Uh, I'm going to say since, um, I don't know when it first started getting popular, but I'm going to say in the 2000s, the early 2000s, it started getting popular, maybe even before that. Uh, but it begot, became very popular and among attorneys. And, and um, so, but before that, what was extreme, very popular was quick claim deeds. So, and, and a, the, the, the example of a quick claim deed is we use quick claim deeds for all kinds of things. So a quick claim deed just means you're transferring whatever it is that you own. That's the definition of a quick claim deed. You own, you're not warranting or guaranteeing that you own it. You're just saying, whatever I do own, I'm transferring it. That's what a quick claim deed is. And so what people would do prior to using ladybird deeds and, and quick claim deeds kind of fell out of fashion, was they would add their kids' names to the deed to their house, or they just outright transfer their their house to their kids' names, and then uh, and then and most of the time what they would do is they would not file that deed. Uh, lawyers will often refer to that as a pocket deed. In other words, we take the deed and we put it in our pocket, and nobody knows about it, and we have a little note on there. Sometimes I see these all the time. It says a sticky note that says, "Don't file until mom dies," right? And we file it after mom dies. Well. Lawyers figured out a long time ago that that's a really, really bad idea and causes all kinds of trouble having that quick claim deed, adding the kids' names, and then filing it after death. Um, just very quickly, because I'm not, we're not, this is not a presentation about quick claim deeds, and most lawyers are going to tell you that's a bad idea, but a lot of lawyers have now substituted that for the, the ladybird deed for, for these other deeds, these pocket deeds that we used to call them. Um, and so most lawyers have figured out this is a really bad idea, and we've had this come up in our office frequently recently, where we had a deed, there's a deed out there somewhere, we know it's out there, uh, and it gets lost. That original deed gets lost, or you know we don't have a copy of it. So number one is a pocket deed can be destroyed, it can be lost, it can be, you know, we can't find it, it can be spilled coffee on, it could be where it's not in recordable form. There's, there's all these problems with uh, preparing a deed and not filing it, and that was the old-fashioned advice. So now a lot of those folks that would have otherwise done a quick claim deed, and now as that's kind of fallen out of fashion, now they're doing ladybird deeds, and we don't have that, that particular problem, but we have lots of other problems. 
the other big problem with quick claim deeds, and there's a million, <laughs> I can probably off the top of my head give you 15 reasons why adding your kids' names to your deed is such a bad idea. But here's the key. This is the most obvious one. If you file, if you prepare that deed, sign that deed, put it in your pocket, and then file it years later, who's going to be the first one to notice that the deed is signed earlier, you know, signed in an earlier year? It's going to be the tax assessor, the property tax assessor. And I will tell you, almost to a to a you know to a township, to a you know to a uh, every single time, the tax assessor is going to be happy because they're going to be able to go back. And if your house was uh, under, uh, you know, had personal residence exemption or something they call it homesteaded, property taxes are going to go up. They're going to charge penalties for not filing that deed. They're going to charge pen penalties for not paying the right amount of taxes because you lost that homestead exemption. Maybe even uncapping in some situations where they could have reassessed the, the property. Um, so the property tax, you could end up with a big property tax bill when you go to file that deed after mom dies, okay? that wasn't a thing in 1970 you know when my grandmother passed away a lawyer went up to the hospital had her sign a deed she passed away a few days later the deed was filed and the tax assessor didn't think anything of it some people say well what if we just don't date the deed and then we date it the day mom dies or something like that no nope, you can't do that either because the deed has to be notarized and you can't have you can't commit fraud you know, that would be committing fraud, number one. But number two is you can't even have that anyway because no notary that wants to, you know, not break the law is going to not date the, the document. So that was the old way that people has really much, pretty much fallen out of fa fashion. I, I rarely hear of any attorneys that are still recommending adding the kids' names through a quick claim deed and then putting it in your pocket and filing it later. But a lot of times what we've replaced it with is this idea of a... Um, a uh, ladybird deed. So what is a ladybird deed? In concept, it seems kind of simple. In concept, it seems kind of simple to the extent that it says, when I die, I want these people to own the property, okay? So it's, uh, it, 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 you, you basically retain all rights to the property until your death. And that means if you sign one of these, it solves uh, several of the problems of the quick claim deed in that you still technically, you still own it. You still have all the rights to it you could file a new deed, you could get a mortgage, although the mortgage company might not like the ladybird deed. So I found that you know a lot of mortgage companies are gonna make you uh, get rid of that ladybird deed, but you could sell it, you could uh, you can do other things with it, which is another problem. I see people will do a ladybird deed and then they'll do a quick claim deed or they'll do a quick claim deed and a ladybird deed and they do multiple deeds and I, they come in and all of these contradictory deeds you shouldn't be doing this without an attorney. You shouldn't be doing it without making sure that the, the, we know the history of it and whether there's any outstanding deeds there. Um, but the idea is you retain all rights to it. And then when you die, it's supposed to transfer to whoever it is, whatever group of people uh, that you wanted it to go to. Seems simple. It's not. Okay. So that's the first problem with any of these types of deeds, whoops, is that people thinking that it's a simple document. Oh my goodness! I can't believe there's a real the, there's a uh, a title or um I can't believe there's a a, a a county office that's handing out form ladybird deeds. That's just a that's a really such a bad idea. The lack of per precision in any deed. A deed is typically might be one page long, right? A deed might be one or two pages long. You're not going to have the precision, and we're going to get into what I mean by lack of precision. I'll give you a couple of examples, and then we'll come back to them. What if the people you leave it to aren't alive when you when when you die? What if um, you know the uh, there's uh, often the, the there's a lack of precision as far as we don't know what the world's going to look like in three years. We don't know what the world's going to look like in six months. The year 2020 kind of told us that yeah we don't know what the world's going to look like tomorrow. Sometimes right? It we cannot fully predict you would have to have a crystal ball and know exactly who's gonna be alive and what their circumstances are, whether they're going through a divorce, whether they have any financial issues, any other problems that might be going on in their life. And you'd have to know all of those things at the time you sign the ladybird deed and because you might not die for 20 years, right? And even if you died six months from now, we don't know that the, the circumstances six months from now. The people you leave might not be there. They might be going through troubles. They might be going through a divorce. They might be going through financial issues. They might be in a nursing home. God forbid. Now we have a property that's going to end up being eaten up by the nursing home potentially. So the idea is 
a simple, it lacks precision because we don't have the flexibility to adjust to whatever happens next. Occasionally I'll have folks, they'll say, oh, well, you know, if anything changes, we'll just come back and do a new ladybird deed. Well, first of all, no, you won't. <laughs> and I can say that because I've been doing this for 20 years and people don't do that. When something changes in their life, they don't automatically, the first thing they do isn't always to call their lawyer and, and, and say, we need to update this. The second thing is because you're not thinking of all the potential problems and all the potential issues that could be there, you don't even necessarily recognize when it needs to be changed. You know, so w what if your your daughter's going through a divorce? Would you think about changing your lady bird deed? What if your your child got sick? What if their spouse, your daughter's husband is sick and might need to go to a nursing home? Would you think about changing your lady bird deed for that? You'd need to, it's a good idea, you should. Frankly, you shouldn't have the lady bird deed in the first place, that's the point. Because we can't predict the future and a lady bird deed can't adjust or adapt to what's gonna happen next. Um, thinking that you can use plain English. I did a, a webinar um, a few months ago now on just the problems with deeds, right? And uh, and so many times, we this is once a week, we see bad deeds that are causing people all kinds of problems in the office, whether it's a ladybird deed or a warranty deed or quick claim deed or whatever it is, and particularly those that are for people that are writing them themselves. They're filling out their own deeds and thinking that you can use plain English. Nope. Plain English doesn't work in the law. I always tell this quick story, and I won't go too far down this tangent, but when I was in my first year of law school, they brought an English professor over from the undergrad to try to teach these, these potential future lawyers how to speak in plain English, because there, there was this whole movement towards plain English for, for lawyers. And uh, she, she took this paragraph, this English professor took this paragraph, and it, you know, it was a whole page paragraph of a statute, and she said, well, I can reduce this to to two sentences or one sentence. And we had all of these cocky first year law students that were, they, we picked it apart in a second. Uh, there was the, the, her new phrase, we said, well, what does this mean? And that could be interpreted 12 different ways. And, you know, I don't know if you remember back in the 90s, there was the uh, famous politician, a president who, uh, his, his argument when he got in trouble is, well, that's the, depends on what the definition of is is he was literally arguing about what the definition of is is and uh and it, that's what lawyers do and you can't just use plain english i know people would love that but it's not precise that's why lawyers do what they do that's why often when we have contracts or trusts or things like that there are many more pages than you'd like them to be is because we have to be precise. We have to know that 20 years from now, another lawyer, a judge, uh, you know, people in the legal industry are going to be able to know exactly what was intended and not misinterpret it based on the definition of what is is or what the definition of, you know, next of kin is or, you know, any of these other things. You can't just expect that plain English is going to be used properly. In fact, I can guarantee you a lot of times using plain English, it is going to be specifically wrong because it is uh we had the sort of for example um if you say um uh you know you buy property with husband and wife and you say you know uh, uh george and susan uh, uh own this together well that's wrong george and susan are husband and wife we have to specifically identify the nature of their relationship within the deed and we have to use the proper language for that and if we don't guess what we're going to have a different property right if we use plain english we're, we're not but george and susan aren't going to own the property in the same way as if we if we use the proper language and of course the wrong type of deed so i'm going to um go ahead and there we go so uh instead of going through and having this powerpoint presentation I just wanna go through a few things and we are gonna talk about the good things in a ladybird deed. I promise there are good things in a ladybird deed. We're gonna talk about those, but since the topic is what's bad about ladybird deeds, I'm gonna start off with the bad. So we're gonna start off with the bad. These are all bad. There's no good in these parts. And then I'm gonna go through the good and why sometimes the good isn't good enough and why we need to have better planning for that. So the all bad. What if the property has a lien against it? What if the property has a mortgage? What if the property has an encumbrance against it? Okay, you may, the person that you're leaving it to 
now doesn't have a say. So if you leave it to them in a trust or a will, if you leave the property to them in a the proper way, they could just choose not to accept it. They can say, hey, this property has a lien on it. I don't want to pay that lien. The property value has gone down. It's, you know, got a, a reputation because it's in Flint and it has, you know, people still think the Flint water crisis and, or, you know, whatever the situation is. For some reason, that we think that the, the, the person that you want to leave it to doesn't want to accept it because it's going to be a liability rather than a benefit to them. That there's too much of a lien or there's some other problem with it or there's an easement or whatever it is and they don't want it. Well, if they inherit it through a trust or a will or through another proper mechanism, they can refuse. They can say no. They can't do that with the ladybird deed. You've already given it to them. They didn't even have to sign accepting it. It's just theirs now. And now, guess what? That liability is theirs too, potentially. They've got to deal with this and, and they can't walk away from it. So if there's a lien against it, if there's a mortgage against it, often a ladybird deed is going to be a bad idea. What if there is a problem with the property? Okay, so um, uh, like an environmental problem with the property. What if there is some kind of uh, flooding issue? What if there is... Um, one of the things uh, many years ago, I used to do more courtroom work and I had a case on underground storage tanks. Well, you wouldn't, you'd be amazed. I learned a lot about underground storage tanks. You'd be amazed how many properties, even in, I used to own a property in Saginaw, just a one single city lot in Saginaw, and it had an underground storage tank on there. Why? Because people used, you know, home heating fuel that they had uh, a storage tank for their heat for their house. Uh, before consumers power and all of this type of stuff. And so there's underground storage tanks all over the place. Well, what if there's contamination? What if there's a leaking underground storage tank, which is what we're worried about? And now the owner of that property is going to be liable for maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in environmental damage. And you've just imposed that on them. You've imposed that on them because you said a ladybird and you said, yeah, I want to give this to my kids. And now your kids have this environmental damage because they own this property, even without, you know, them wanting to own the property. So any, you know, we don't know. Sometimes we don't know that there's going to be environmental damage in the future. Again, not being able to predict the future. The biggest issue. The biggest issue is multiple beneficiaries. Okay. So a lot of times it's that it's not that we're leaving the house to one person. Um, or sometimes I'll have um, clients that will say, well, I want to leave it to this one person and then they're going to sell it and divide up the money between the others. No, 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 no. Well, that's already a bad idea. We want to have somebody be the executor. Sure, that's great. We want them the successor trustee or the executor under the will. We don't want to leave it to that person and then have them have the obligation of selling it and then gifting that money to the other people. It's going to cause them all kinds of trouble. Okay. So typically if we want the money, we want the proceeds to go to the three kids. In order to do a ladybird deed, you have to have all three of them on there. This causes all kinds of trouble. So you imagine that your kids are all going to get along and everything's going to be fine. I can tell you in 20 years of being a lawyer how often that is not the case. I have a case right now that uh, we did not prepare the deed, obviously. We would not have done it. But uh, the mom had left uh, her house to her daughter and then her other child had passed away, so it went on to that child's children. Uh, and, and lawyers, a lot of lawyers say, oh, let's do a ladybird deed. This will avoid probate and it'll be fine. Well, guess what? Now there's you know three or four people on this deed and they can't come to an agreement about how whether we're going to sell it, who we're going to sell it to, who we're going to use a realtor, what we're going to list as the listing price. They have complete disagreement about this. They have complete, um, uh, you know, they, they will not agree. It doesn't matter if we get appraisals, we've gotten appraisals, they're not going to agree on the terms of the sale or even whether it should be sold. And so, uh, so the other people hired a lawyer. And so I called up the lawyer, a very good, talented, uh, local uh, real estate lawyer. And I said, oh man, I hate these lady deeds. And he said, yeah, you know, I see them all the time. And he said, oh, most of the time we just file a partition action. What is a partition action? It means that we're suing our family in court to partition, to have the court order us to partition or ultimately probably sell that property. And the court supervises, you know, the terms of that, that we sort of sell it, you know, uh, on the open market and things like that. He says, oh, yeah, we file partition actions all the time. In fact, before I even called him, he had already prepared the partition action. He had already prepared the legal document. He said, I just assume we're going to file it. It's a ladybird deed. It goes to multiple people. We're just going to file a partition action. So the whole point of the ladybird deed 
was to avoid probate. Well, guess what? <laughs> we avoided probate. Now we're in circuit court. Now we're in circuit court. Worse, it's worse than probate court. And now we all have, you know, separate lawyers and all this other stuff. And what a mess. And he, you know, when I was talking to him, and he's a real estate lawyer, he says, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. You know, when there's a lady bird deed or a quick claim deed, I, you know, I just assume there's going to be a partition action. We're just going to end up in court anyway. And so, and it didn't surprise me a bit. I was like, yeah, I see that. That's why, that's the point of this, is we have multiple people on there. Frequently, there's going to be a problem. Now, I can hear what you're thinking. Even not being able to see you, I can hear what you're thinking. You're saying, well, not with my kids. <laughs> my kids won't argue about it. Okay, well, what if your kids die? What if they're, What if your kid is sick and, and not making the decision? What if it's their spouse making the decision for them because they, they are older and they maybe have some memory issues? What if it's their kids making the decision for them? What if it's your, da your, your, your granddaughter-in-law that's really in charge because she's the one that just kind of takes over on things? How do we know that it's even your kids that are really the ones that have the say in what's going to happen here? We don't know. We don't know because you're not dead yet and you might not be dead for 20 years for all we know. And things might look a lot different by then. So uh, the idea here is that, am I showing? Okay, I think, Savannah, are you there? Can you see? I'm wondering what, what you're seeing right now, Savannah. Right now I just see your face. So I okay, don't see the. That's what I was going for. That's what I was going. I was going for that. I just wanted to make sure it just wasn't the generic uh, view there. So you can see me then. Good. Um, okay. So then um, the next thing that's all bad here uh, is what if somebody dies? So there's a couple of different ways that we can deal with this on the issue of what if somebody dies. Uh, so what would you imagine is going to happen? So you leave it to your three kids, and one of your kids dies before you. Uh, not knowing anything else about the specific details of the, the legal precision of the wording of the deed, what would you expect to happen? I bet you half of you said, <laughs> uh, well, it would go to their kids. If my daughter dies, it's going to go to their kids. And about half of you said, well, uh, if there's three kids and one of them dies, it's going to go to the other two, right? Well, good question, because we don't know. <laughs> and it is going to be partly based on how it's written. But I'm going to tell you the vast majority of time when I've talked to folks about this and they had a lawyer write this up for them or they did their own, you know, they wrote it up themselves and, and used it a form or something like that, that they didn't know the answer to that question based on the way the deed is written. And sometimes based on the way the deed is written, there is no answer. We have to rely on the title company. When we go to sell that property, we have to rely on the title company to say, are you going to accept this? One of the people listed on here is deceased. Are you going to accept that it's just going to be the remaining two? And a lot of times the title company is going to say, no, that's not clear from this. That's not clear. that the, So we're going to, they're going to say, okay, just take that portion to probate. Since there's three people on there, we're going to take one third of the property to probate and have the court tell us what to do. And that's what the title company is going to insist upon in some cases because there is not always clarity. The second problem is a lot of times this is done based on the convenience of the lawyer. And I'm serious about this. When I talk to lawyers about Lady Bird deeds and they say, well, what do you do? Do you do it tenants in common? Do you do it joint tenants with rights of survivorship? And they say, oh, I always do it this way. And I think, okay, well, wait a second. You always do it this way. What does your client want? Does every single client want it that way? And they say, well, no, no, but it's just easier that way. We don't want to have the, you know, it's easier that way. And so a lot of times the deeds are written based on the convenience of the law here and the convenience of how it works for the legal system. Uh, rather than whether you care if your daughter dies, whether or not her family still gets one third share. Sometimes for a lot of folks, the house is the biggest asset that you have. The house is the most valuable asset that you have. And so sometimes you're cutting out one of your families, when, you know, you're cutting out because their mom died or their dad died. Now that family is completely cut out of your estate or at least a share of the house in the estate. And that's probably not what you wanted. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of times lawyers aren't even really focusing on that. They're just saying, well, you know, we're just doing the simple thing. We're not actually doing planning. We're just doing the simple deed that's two pages long and, and uh, you know, what happens happens kind of thing. Well, that's not, this is important. So, you know, this might be your primary asset. And think about how that family would feel if they were left out of it, knowing that, you know, oh, wow. So it's only going to, I have a friend now that this happened to and, uh, and, uh, the, 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 it was a granddaughter 
that was living with and taking care of her grandfather for years. Uh, that she was living there, taking care of him. When uh, she, a lot of times, she had to, you know, she would get him meals. She would help him if he fell down several times, where he had, she had to get him up, and a couple times had to call the, you know, ambulance. Doing this for years, being his caretaker. Clearly, he wanted, uh, and and she was the only child of of his daughter that passed away. Well, because the legal planning was done wrong. She's completely cut out of this. She devoted a good portion of her life to caring for her grandfather. Her grandfather clearly wanted her to have a share in it. Maybe not get the whole house, but at least get her her share of it with the other uh, with with the two, you know, her aunt and her uncle. And uh, she gets none because of poor legal plan. And I blame the lawyer, frankly. I blame the lawyer in that case. I don't think that was what the what the grandfather had intended at all. And it's because of the convenience of the lawyer sometimes. Um, and so that's that's a really bad idea. All right, what other bad things that are going on here? Well, um, lack of legal certainty, we kind of talked about that. Oh, here's a big one. <laughs> Often ladybird deeds are drafted wrong. Just because it says the word ladybird deed on it doesn't mean it actually meets the standard of a ladybird deed. It's actually ladybird deed is just the nickname for it. The actual official title is a land title standards 9.1 or 9.3, something like that. And so Lady Bird Deed is just a nickname for it. Now, there's a whole story why it's called a Lady Bird Deed. It actually has nothing to do with Lady Bird Johnson, of all things. You would think Lady Bird Johnson, right, the, the president, the, the former president's wife. Uh, but that's not what it is. It's actually a whole different story, a long story about why it's called a Lady Bird Deed. But I frequently, frequently, frequently see these deeds drafted incorrectly, even by attorneys. Um, and it should never be a fill in the blank form. So that's all the bad, okay? So we've gone through the bad, now let's get through the sort of good. <laughs> so the two good things that people think and people say about Lady Bird Deeds and why they wanna do them is one, it avoids probate. And so I have a list of five things as to why uh, that's not good enough. <laughs> and the first is it might not avoid probate, okay? If people die in the wrong order, it might still end up in probate or even worse circuit court where it goes through a partition action. Number two, it could end up in court anyway. Number three is it could cause lifelong fights and family disputes. Uh, that example I just gave you of a friend of mine who was caring for her grandfather for years, uh, had lived there, that was her house, uh, and actually her mom, before her mom had died, had lived there too. So it was her house from the time that she was born up through, you know, through, through full adulthood and had been caring for her grandfather, uh, do you think that she's gonna have a good relationship with her aunt and uncle who are now cutting her out completely? Is that, do you think that's gonna not cause a family fight or even just between siblings? I have one uh, person, I haven't heard from him in a while, but um, I used to get a call from him and he'd wanna come in and meet with me just about every year. And what happened was his parents had left him and his brother a house um, and uh, through a ladybird deed, and when parents died, the, him and his brother inherited it. And his brother said, well, I think my son should just live there rent free. And he's like, well, no, I mean, I'll sell you my half, but I'm not gonna just let your son live there rent free. So what did the other brother do? He changed the locks. And so the, the person that comes in to see me, he said, well, I called the police and the police, you know, investigated and they said, well, his name's on the deed. He can, you know, he's an owner. He can change the locks. <laughs> And, and they said, well, but I'm an owner too. What about me? And they said, well, this is a civil matter. You got to file a lawsuit. That's the partition action that we talked about earlier. And so every, for a while, I haven't heard from him in years, but for a while, every year he'd call me up and say, okay, I know we talked about this before, but what are my options? And I, I said, your options are to sue your brother, to file a partition action. And uh, because he changed the locks and they moved his son and his son, and the grandson is, you know, the nephew basically of, of the person that's coming to see me. Uh, was living there rent free and and his inheritance is is useless because he doesn't have so i said yeah absolutely you'll win this lawsuit you can file a lawsuit we can file he's like i don't want to sue my brother i don't want to do that and i said okay well i'll see you next year because <laughs> he called me back the next year i said well what are my options well you can sue your brother that's the option that you have because he changed the locks and he has he's, he's on the deed he's an owner he can change the locks now, would your kids do that? I hope not, but how do we know? How do we know? How do we know that your son or daughter is not actually of advanced age by the time that they receive it and it's not them making the decisions anymore? You know, that it, it could become somebody completely different. So um, so that's that. Um, so it does in fact avoid probate sometimes. 
uh, in, in many cases, but not in every case. Uh, often not going where we want it to go. Okay, so I imagine that the example I gave you earlier where there were three kids and one died, and the one that died had a daughter that took care of grandpa and, and cared for him for years, I don't think grandpa ever would have imagined that that, uh, that it wouldn't have still been split three ways. Well, guess what? It's not. He may have intended that. He may have thought his son and daughter would have done the right thing and, and shared it with the, the, the third family, uh, but that's not the way it's going to work because that's not what the law says and that's not how the deed was drafted. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, attorney convenience rather than good planning. All right, so the last sort of good reason is a uh, reason why people say it, and we do use it for this purpose, is to avoid nursing home spend down. Well, there's, it's, that's too simplistic. So we do use it to avoid nursing home spend down in specific cases, but I think people here and lawyers hear this that don't do a lot of nursing home and Medicaid work, and they're like, cool, we can protect the house from nursing home. And they don't think about anything else or any of the nuance that's involved in it. And the reality is um, just having a ladybird deed is not going to protect the house from the nursing home because what's going to happen? If it's a single person going into a nursing home, who's living in the house? Who's maintaining the house? Who's paying the taxes on the house? Who's paying the upkeep in the, uh, of the house? So a lot of times the family says, you know, after dad's been in the nursing home for a year or six months or two years or whatever, they say, well, this is just a burden. We're having to pay the taxes. We're going to have to pay the upkeep. Nobody wants this house. We, we should just sell it. But we've got this ladybird deed, so it's going to protect it, right? No. <laughs> as soon as you sell it, as long as dad's still alive, all of that money is exposed to the nursing home. So that ladybird deed did not help us one bit of the nursing home if we end up having to sell the house prior to, to, to uh, dad or mom's death. Um, secondly, it's often done where lawyers will say, oh, we're going to do this ladybird deed because it's going to protect it from the nursing home. But then it says mom and dad are still living. Well, what typically happens if somebody goes into a nursing home? It's not both mom and dad going to the nursing home at the same time. It's one of them goes into the nursing home. Well, then that ladybird deed didn't solve the problem at all because what's likely to happen, what happens is uh, more often than not, and this may be a shock to some of you, but oddly enough, it's the healthy spouse that dies first in most of those situations. It's the caregiver spouse, the healthy spouse. So one spouse is in a nursing home, it's the other spouse that dies first. Statistics tell us this, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why that is. The stress, everything else associated with that, all the work that they were doing to care for their spouse. This, the healthy spouse dies first more than 50% of the time. So now what do we have? We said this ladybird deed is going to help us, but it didn't help us a bit because it said from mom and dad to the kids after I die. But what happens? Dad goes to the nursing home, mom dies. Now the house is only in dad's name. That doesn't do us a lick of good. It doesn't help us one bit in protecting the house from the nursing home because now we have an empty house. We get back to that issue. If we sell the house, we're going to lose it. So the better answer, what we would have done is we would have actually transferred the house to mom, to the healthy spouse. That way, if she dies, we can make sure it transfers to the kids without having to go through dad or transfers to a trust that's going to you know, be for dad's benefit or whatever. But the bottom line is we can protect that house. We just don't want it to end up in dad's name and have to be sold. And then that money is exposed to the nursing home. So these are a bit complicated answers. I get this is very nuanced, and that's the point. That's the point of all of this. The law is nuanced. That's why you need a good lawyer. You need somebody that's thought about all of this for 20 years and thinks through the consequences of things. Not just, hey, this looks good because if you died today, this would work out perfectly. You're not going to die today. And so it is nuanced. It is complicated. People think this is simple. It's, you know, you don't want it to look simple and have complicated results. We want simple results. And that's what our goal is. Our goal is to create simple results, not have something that looks simple because it's only one page long, but causes all kinds of havoc and all kinds of problems. So that's it. Those are the those are my ins and outs of Ladybird Deed. They are sometimes good. We do sometimes use them, but we rarely uh, think that it's a good idea for just generic estate planning. There are a, a small number of cases where we will look at that um, for uh, for estate planning purposes, uh, but it's pretty rare. Uh, so if it's just to pass it on to the kids, there are better options. Even just having it go through probate is often a better option in, in many cases. And, and, and I'm not a big fan of probate. If you know anything about me, I'm not a big fan of probate. So Savannah, I'm going to have you uh, step in and see if there's any uh, questions that we need to address.
and um, then tell the folks how they can get more information. Awesome, thank you, Bob. Um, as Bob mentioned, we do have a way for you to get more information. Um, I've already put one of those ways to contact us in the chat, and that's just our phone number. Um, you can contact us by calling 810-694-9000. Um, I've also got um, an email that's coming out to you shortly. Um, that email will have a link. Um, the link will take you to a calendar. From that calendar, you'll be able to choose a day and a time when a member of our team can give you a call. Um, and this call will last probably about 15 minutes. It'll give you a chance to ask questions to our team um, about our process, about what to expect when you work with us. And then we can ask you questions about your situation, your goals, and just make sure that we are the best firm to be able to help you with those needs. So again, I encourage you to give us a call at 810-694-9000. Um, also check your email, you should have that any moment. Oh, and it looks like we might actually have a question that just popped through. And it's just from Janice who says thank you. And thank you, Janice, for attending. And thanks for everyone else for attending today, too. We hope to hear from you soon. And we will talk to you next week for another Webinar Wednesday.